Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. On today's episode, we're taking a deep dive into consumer rights. My guest is Teal Lido, a Harvard Law School grad and the founder of a company called Fair Shake, which looks to help consumers who have legitimate disputes, as so many of us experience, with uh, large companies, uh, telecom companies, banks, airlines, rental car companies, and, and so on, but don't know how to navigate the system of bringing such a dispute. Often these are disputes that by the hidden language of the contract, whether you signed in person or online somehow, uh, that forces you into some kind of arbitration, which can be a very intimidating world, not to mention you're one person standing up against a big company. Uh, and we talk about how consumers can pursue their rights, why companies are very receptive. We might not be, um, you might be surprised to hear that. Uh, once you do navigate the system, companies can be very receptive to resolving those disputes if you know how. Uh, so it's a fascinating conversation about the ways in which consumers can, pardon my French, get screwed unless you know what to do. And Teal has figured out a system for helping consumers figure out exactly what to do. So a great episode for all consumers out there, millions of Americans who run up against some big company. Um, I think you're going to really enjoy and learn a lot from this episode. Stay tuned. As somebody who has spent the last almost 25 years working for individuals and families to bring them a measure of justice when they have been wronged or injured, I was very drawn to the subject and venture of my guest on today's episode, uh, Teal Lidow, and the company that he and his fiance have started called Fair Shake. And we're going to hear about that. And first, welcome, Teal, to the program. Teal, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law today. Thanks, Aaron. I'm excited to be here. I automatically put this in the category of good law because I think the law should serve people and help them, as I said, achieve a measure of justice when they've been wronged. Um, t t maybe start by telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, what Fair Shake is uh, and how, how you came to start this company. Sure, sure. So uh, I'm an attorney. Um, I, I graduated from Harvard Law School in 2012 and went to go work at Cravath doing mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm. so sort of a, a traditional corporate law background. Right, one, of the, big, and, one um, of the big Wall Street big firms in New York City. Right, right. And, and so th this was doing, you know, working with big companies that were buying and selling each other and, and doing these kind of large transactions. And I, I felt like it wasn't really for me. Um, and I, I, I sort of dove out of that into the startup world. So I, I started started a company that um, that uh, made and sold uh, clothing. Uh, I went to go work for LegalZoom, doing product development for them, and uh, and sort of had this, this wandering path. Um, and at, at some point on that path, I got into a, a dispute with this big airline who had sent me on a 72-hour detour off of my intended flight path and, um, and, and basically told me to buzz off when I asked them to... Um, for, for compensation. Well, tell, tell and, us tell uh, us the story. Tell us what happened because that uh, I fly a lot. I'm sure a lot of people fly a lot, but I I've never had a 72 hour detour. That sounds pretty horrible. <laughs> yeah, so I was flying from it was it was horrible. I was flying from Chile to New York, and it was supposed to be a direct flight. And instead of being a direct flight, uh, it um, there was a a, a Visibly drunk passenger who is allowed onto the on, onto the plane when we boarded, um, and we had to make an emergency landing in uh, in Ecuador, um, and uh, and this 
this started off this kind of operational uh, journey where the airline was trying to get this plane plane load of people to where they were supposed to go, but but all these things were going wrong. Uh, planes weren't where they were supposed to be. Uh, staff wasn't where they were supposed to be. And uh, for various reasons, it, it just took 72 hours. And it, it resulted in, uh, you know, two two unintended stamps in my passport, so in Peru and Ecuador, and uh, and and just many many hours of kind of being herded around in, in buses um, because the airline just couldn't really get it together to get us where we were supposed to go. And I, I think that it's a it's a slightly more extreme version of an experience that a lot of people have had. Right. And I I think everyone's familiar with uh, what what happened during that, which is that the airline at some point kind of sends you an email or hands you a piece of paper um, with a with a waiver of liability in it, a release clause that basically says, you know, you agree not to sue us for this, and here here are a couple hundred dollars in, in flight vouchers, and um, and that's what they did to us. Uh, so they they offered us three hundred dollars in flight vouchers, and they kind of just walked down a line at, when we were herded together in this airport. They just walked down a the line. They were just handing out this piece of paper, you know, to, to everyone standing in this line. And they're handing out pens, and they're saying, "Sign this, and we'll give you some flight vouchers." And and I looked at this piece of paper, and it was a really ironclad, you know, release clause. And it it basically said I, I couldn't sue them for anything, you know, now or or in the future. And um and I and I thought it was I thought it was crazy, and I thought it was uh, not sort of um, in line with the the mayhem and the chaos that this airline had had caused for hundreds of us. And um, and frankly, you know, to some extent, the the danger that they put us in by allowing us to burst on the flight. And so, of course, and of course, um, as a lawyer, we're we're conditioned to see when we see the word release. You know, we know that that's a radioactive word, and we ought to, and our antenna go up, and we want to say, what What do you mean, release my rights? What is that all about? I mean, that's right. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's but your average that, person doesn't. You know, I think I think doesn't dig into it, mm-hmm. doesn't see it there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, so I didn't sign that piece of paper, and I, I turned to the people, you know, in front and, and behind us. I was with my my then fiance, now wife, and, and we um, and I, I kind of said, you know, be, be a little bit careful about this. You know, make sure to read this and understand what you're signing away. And and we just sort of folded up the, the piece of paper and and put it in our bags and went home. And. Uh, and when I when I got home, I I started looking into how I actually bring a, a dispute, file a claim against this company, and um, and it threw me into this really fascinating world that I haven't emerged from yet, which is this kind of new world of consumer disputes um, in the age of of mandatory arbitration. Mm, um, yeah. So I you know dug into contracts. I I researched this this process I went through it and I, I wound up filing a claim and within a couple of weeks this company was calling me um, asking how they could make the the situation right kind of treating me like a like a human being listening to my side of the story you know trying to figure out what my damages were and and they put a very generous settlement offer on the table within about three weeks and it was this this really unusual and shocking experience for someone who's, even though I'm a lawyer, used to sort of being uh, blown off by by large companies. And um, un- unusual enough that I started talking to my friends and family about it. And almost everyone I talked to said I would love to kind of have that same shifting of the table, turning of the table, that kind of, you know, empowering experience with the company X that, you know, is has I've got a billing issue with right now, or a big company Y who never provided the service that they said they were gonna they were gonna provide to me. Well, we're and, we're, um, we're going realizing. Yeah, we're gonna get in a second yeah. to how that led you to think of this as an actual business idea. But I but I just want to understand the choice that you recognized you had, but that most everybody else in that long line and wherever it was the airline had herded you to, didn't realize, which is that you you actually did have a choice not to sign away your rights for what to the airline was peanuts, a voucher, you know, of just, you know, a few hundred dollars. You had the choice not to sign away your rights, but it would certainly must have taken some effort 
to exercise the other option, which was to press a claim. And you, and you knew how to do that uh, or f knew how to figure out how to do that. And obviously, it made a big difference. Yeah, yeah, it made a huge difference. And I think for, for everyone else, you know, I've, I've, I can now, in retrospect, kind of see what they were thinking because I, I deal with a lot of people who have these sorts of experiences, of, you know, every day now. And I, I think that when they get that piece of paper, a few things go through their mind. One is, um, you know, I, I know that this is a big company, and if I try to fight what they're proposing as the resolution to this problem, uh, I'm just never going to budge them. So it's not even worth it. And, and that's, you know, that's one thing that they think. And then the second thing that they think is, um, oh, if this issue is big enough, someone will just file a class action about it, and I can just be sort of a passive participant in this situation. And they're they're not, and I'm sure that we'll talk about this in 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 a, in a few minutes. But the there's, that's not really that's not really what happens in in, in a lot of the economy these days. Um, and then the the final thing that they think is, well, if I had to actually bring some sort of individualized claim here, it would be way more trouble than it's worth. You know, I've already lost all these hours, all this time, and if I have to go. And, and figure out how to do this and grapple with this system and actually try to figure out, you know, how to bring some sort of individualized claim, uh, the, the cost to me is just going to far outweigh, um, you know, whatever I get from it. Right. Even so all, just all to hire a lawyer, uh, w w you know, yeah. would, would they, people probably figure and probably figure correctly would cost a lot of money, maybe more than the, the claim is actually worth. Yep. Yep. So you sign that paper. And that, that's, I think, the rational choice given what most people know about the system. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so, so tell us then, how, how did that lead you to see a business opportunity? And, 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 and tell us about the business that you've created to, to deal with these kinds of situations for people who aren't lawyers, obviously, like you are, like I am, and, and to help them in exercising the choice that you exercised for yourself to, to a much greater advantage than if you had if you if you'd gone the other way. Yeah, so I I saw a business opportunity uh, opportunity in this. You know, as I was saying before, sort of immediately after I went through it, I saw an enormous amount of demand out there. So I I, I was talking about this experience, and not because I was trying to sound out a business opportunity, but just because I found it. Sort of shocking to have the experience that I had, which was having a, a really big company kind of come to the table and treat me like a human being who had a real dispute. Um, and and I, I was just chatting with people about it, and, and everyone I chatted with seemed to want that sort of thing and that sort of experience. So, you know, a, a business has many components, and one is the demand for the business. And it was just clear to me that the, the demand was there. And I think it was so overwhelming uh, that that I started thinking about the other components of, of what makes up a business. And as I was going through this process, I've learned a lot about this consumer dispute system and the way it works, how the system is organized, um, what people do and don't know about it. And, and it became pretty clear to me that this was a system that was very, very hard to use if you didn't have any sort of legal understanding or confidence, really, um, but fairly fairly simple in its basic process and mechanics. And it was a place where you could apply simple automation and sort of simple workflows um, that would allow people to access it pretty smoothly in large numbers. Um, and no one was, was doing that, um, and I think it was a combination of no one knew the system was there to access, um, and everyone assumed it was going to be too hard, but if you if you built a tool that sort of made it more efficient, then uh, then it would all of a sudden become this rational thing um, for people to make use of when they when they had to dispute. So, so you so, so all what, of those yes, go ahead, sure. All all of those things started to sort of work out. It was like there's there's huge demand there, and and I saw a really clear way to build a a, a software product and and a service that could could meet that and could for a lot of people kind of deliver that same sort of empowerment that I had felt. Well, and I want to talk more too about about the service and and what people need to know and understand 
can can happen for them if they if they take advantage of this. But the the experience that that launched this for you was a dispute with an airline, and you've you've referred a couple of times to consumer disputes generally. What what are some of the other areas as you started to look around where you realized? Hey, there's a real demand here, meaning there are people with real disputes. We're not talking about frivolous disputes or people just looking for, you know, a quick check, but people who have real disputes and feel a real power imbalance between themselves as an individual consumer and some large company. What what are some of the other areas besides airlines that you found uh there there is this demand, meaning there is this uh issue that many people can have, uh, are, are we talking other kinds of transportation companies or, or uh, you know, big soup, uh, department store? I mean, what kind, of, what kind of entities are we talking about? Yeah, so th- there, there's actually data out there about this. Um, the, the largest single bulk of consumer disputes uh, is in the, the telecom industry. So this is you know, wireless carriers, ISPs, cable and satellite TV companies, the, the Comcast and AT&Ts of the world um, produce about 40% of the consumer dispute volume wow. every year. Incredible. Um, I mean, not incredible if you've been a Comcast customer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there's, you know, I, and, and, and I don't want to single out any individual companies, really, but as an industry, it has all of these it has all of these ingredients that make it really susceptible to things going poorly for right. consumers. Well, the volume so, is there. there. I mean, the volume uh, of re- you know the number of relationships is 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 enormous. Everybody's going to have a cell phone with a cell phone right. plan or home uh, internet service or, or what have you. So just from that alone, you'd think yep. there would be a lot of disputes. Yeah. Yep, and in, in addition to just it, it being everywhere and there being hundreds. Of millions of contracts out there. I mean, many more contracts than there are, you know, citizens of the United States just in that one industry. Um, the contracts are high value, so we're talking, you know, thousands of dollars per year that people pay for their their cell phone and their their internet, and a lot of the stuff is bundled together now. Um, and you have a situation where you're 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 a, you're in a subscription service. You're putting down a credit card, and the company is sort of deciding what they're going to bill you for every month in a way that's not always totally transparent to the person who put down their credit card. Um, so, you, you, you know, that, that industry has a lot of kind of volatile components to, to the way their business is structured that, that results in a lot of disputes. Um, and, you know, other big ones are, are banking, um, mm-hmm. they're, you know, credit cards and, and banks, um, which the, the CFPB sort of made a dent in in, in the past, but um, not so much anymore. And, uh, you know, uh, home security, gyms, uh, travel, you know, rental cars. Um, a lot of these industries that I think all of us can think back over the last five years and think of at least, you know, two or three instances in which we got frustrated with a rental car company or, or our bank for some sort of fee or something like that. So they're, they're, they're sort of the, you know, the usual suspects as far as, as, as problem industries. All right. So, so what, um, what then are some examples of the kinds of things consumers would have a valid dispute about? I'm thinking, because I think there can probably be a lot of confusion about what is a valid dispute. For example, I, I just called my um, home internet uh, cable company, and uh, you know I've been getting an electronic b- b- reminder to pay the bill, but I don't actually see the bill very often. And it just occurred to me I I want to know what I'm actually paying for every month, and I called to say, hey, can I get a? How do I get a copy of the bill? I want to see itemized what it is. And the person on the other end said to me, would you like me to look and see how I might be able to reduce your bill? And I said, uh, sure. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. And and two minutes later, I we reduced my monthly bill by over $100 a month. And I thought, what a dummy I am. That I have, I, I, I'm sure I must now have been overpaying 
by that amount. I didn't even know it. I didn't even know that option existed just by making a phone call. Now that, I would say that's as much my fault as anybody's in this case, but I would, you know, how do we know what actually is a dispute and what are the kinds of things that are valid disputes? Because I'll, I'll, I'll offer myself up as an example of that. To me, and I'm saying this also as a lawyer, I have to accept responsibility because I just didn't look and I didn't ask. But there must yep. be other, yep. other situations where, uh, where as a consumer you are being taken advantage of in some way and you didn't know that you yeah. were, right? And I, I assume those are the kinds of things that, that you're looking to, to help people with. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think what happened to you wouldn't necessarily, you know, I, I don't necessarily see a basis for a claim. Right. What happened I don't either. You, <laughs> frequently, frequently what, what happened to you just now, um, blow, you know, does blow up on consumers. And, and this is how it blows up is that you call your, you know, your cable company and you ask them, hey, can I reduce my bill? And they say, we've got this great promotion for right. you. That's what she said. And and they say, I can reduce your bill by $100 a month, and it's a click of a button. And you hear that information, and you say, yeah, sounds good. Click that button. And what you don't realize is that you know th that person had an incentive to sell you something that, you know, the, that the company had sort of decided to roll out that month. And, you know, this is something that might cost you more a year from now than you're paying, you know, before she clicked that button, you got the discount. But you didn't really fully understand the terms of that, and they weren't fully disclosed to you. Um, and then that that turns into a potentially, you know, a, a deceptive sales practice type claim, where, you, you know, what, what you thought you were getting, which was basically, oh, we can just reconfigure your services, you'll get the same services for $100 less per month, actually was, we're going to put you on a more expensive plan with some sort of temporary discount that so looks cheaper to you right now, but actually it's totally contrary to what you just called in and asked to do, which was lower your bill. Um, so, you know, these sorts of things do turn into real claims. Um, the, I, I think the volume of real claims out there, situations where people have actually had some sort of, they've experienced some sort of you know, borderline fraud, a deceptive sales practice, some sort of uh, contract contract uh, dispute where the service that they were promised was not delivered. Let's say you, you contract for a certain speed of internet and a different ones uh, provided, or you contract to, you know, have a monitored security system and it just never works, something like that. Um, there's a huge, huge number of those actual real claims out there. Um, and we're, we we kind of estimated at around 76 million U.S. consumers every who have a dispute that's serious enough that they put significant time and effort into trying to get the company to resolve it through you know directly just kind of negotiating with the company and fail and walk away and and are really you know frustrated about it. Um, so so not something where you know it's a it's a frivolous claim, something that the consumer doesn't really notice, something where the, the consumer doesn't feel like they've lost money. I mean, enough to really motivate the consumer to go and sit on the phone for hours trying to get the thing resolved. Um, that's, you know, tens and tens of millions of people every year. Mm. Okay, so the name of the company you started um, is called Fair Shake, which is a great name, by the way. Um, how you mentioned developing a software. I mean, how does how does the company work? It, it, it's some, a potential uh, client who's had has some type of consumer dispute with a bank or a cell phone company or, or an airline. Um, how how does it work? Right. So they, you know, usually what happens is <clears throat> if you have a dispute with a a bank or a telco. Um, and, and you go and you try to solve the problem directly with them and it doesn't work, um, you'll, you'll maybe go online and try to leave a bad review or something. And, and when you do that, um, many people discover us as, as an option, uh, fairshake.com. And uh, they come to our website and we, we do two things, really. One is we, we tell them that there's this better way out there. 
you know, that you don't need to just go to the company and ask them to do the right thing, that you don't just need to, you know, scream into the void and, and put out some ugly tweets or leave a bad review, that there is this kind of neutral legal process that they can go through um, to, to have their dispute heard and, and potentially resolved. And so we, we try and educate them. And then the second thing we do, and this is sort of where the, the tech comes in, is we try and make it as easy as possible for them to access that system. So, it, you know, whereas if you, if you try to just do it yourself, you're dealing with, you know, pouring through a contract, figuring out what this dispute process is hidden in the contract, uh, um, you know, generating one set of documents, mailing them by certified mail, waiting a certain period of time, generating a second set of documents, filing those documents, um, serving process, all of this stuff. Um, what, what we do is we just give them a, a, a very simple web form that they can enter their information, talk about their dispute, say what they want, click a button, and we go and automate all of that on the back end. Um, so we're, we're, really, we're really taking care of all of this sort of, you know, paper shuffling, document generation, uh, mailing, um, filing, that, that is enough of a hassle that most people will just not access the system if they have to do it themselves. Mm. And I, I want to be clear, too, for our listeners, I'm not uh, in a position to endorse Fair Shake. I'm not, uh, you know, they're not a sponsor of the podcast or anything like this. But I, I, I thought this was interesting enough from a access to justice perspective, because uh, I think you're right. Uh, the, the, the justice system kind of writ large, and in particular when it comes to consumers, uh, imagining a challenge to a big company, uh, AT&T, Verizon, Wells Fargo, you know, what are the big airlines? I mean, it can be so intimidating. Um, and so I think that uh, I, I would, you know, encourage people if, if, if they are interested in this, where would they go? We go to fairshake.com and check out your website and find out more about what you're all about. Is that the best way for people to do that? Yeah, so they, they can visit fairshake.com if they if they want to set a claim, um, and if they want to go through this process themselves. I think if they want to orient themselves to the larger issue here of sort of you know consumers consumer access to justice and the, the major hurdles that the major new hurdles that consumers face um, just sort of in the last decade, um, I would I would highly recommend. Um, Going online and uh, and just looking for you know articles about mandatory arbitration. Yeah, well, this, I was going to come really back to that. New, new frontier. Yeah, that's such yeah. a huge issue. Um, but before we get to that, because I, I I had definitely had it in mind to circle back to that issue with you. Um, are there any metrics that you have for how you have been able to help people? How you, how successful? your efforts have been to date? Yeah, so we, you know, th uh, this is actually, this this company and this project is just sort of becoming public now, but I and, and several other people have been working on this for a, a couple of years now, and we've, we've actually helped many thousands of people go through this process, um, Mostly just in the telecom industry, but also uh, you know some in some in banks and credit reporting issues, and various other industries. And um, what what we basically see is that you know it's it if if you have a, a real claim and you are highly motivated to get it solved, um, your your odds of getting a a really reasonable resolution to your dispute are actually pretty high if you go through an official, you know, legal dispute process. Um, relative to just calling customer service or, or leaving a bad review, um, it's it's about double to triple the the effectiveness with getting a company to actually kind of come to the table and, and try and fix the the underlying issue. Um, and uh, and and we see people getting fairly large value um, uh, resolutions and settlements out of it. Um, so we're talking hundreds or thousands of dollars in value with you know uh, a bill adjustments and refunds and even punitive damages going through this process. Um, whereas uh, you know in, in the traditional system you're sort of 
generally lucky if you can get someone to, you know, to even express some sympathy with you over the phone, you know, through the customer service channel. Well, let me ask you about that, because it's uh, it's obvious from the company standpoint to go back to that 72 hour detour example that, that you experienced personally. From the company's perspective, it's obviously a lot easier and a lot less expensive for them to hand out release forms and, and a, uh, an airline voucher walking down the line of people than to face uh, the possibility of each of those becoming some kind of dispute through through whatever process and certainly has to be seen as much less uh, expensive for the company than facing the possibility of a class action. That's something you, me- you also mentioned in the beginning. I would assume that the willingness of companies to resolve individual claims through a service like Fair Shake also, from the company's perspective, has to be seen through uh, the lens of what are the alternatives. And they, it would be a lot less expensive for the company even to pay multiples of, of what they would be prepared to pay walking down that line of people herded into some room um, than to face actual litigation where they then have to hire lawyers to defend themselves, sort of a class action that could potentially involve tens of thousands of claims or even more. Is that part of the dynamic that 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 you're counting on, that if people actually know how to press their rights and pursue a claim, the chances of that claim being successful, assuming it's a valid claim, of course, uh, are greater because the company ought to be highly motivated to resolve those claims? Yeah, and I think I think that we're looking at sort of miniature versions of large value civil claims here, and and there, I think there's a lot of theory around settlements for large value civil claims, but the general, I think I think that the general feeling is that most major civil cases should probably settle before they get to trial, um, because everyone is is pretty good at avoiding administrative costs and at more or less guessing based off of the facts of, of the claim and the law, you know, how the thing will wind up if it does go to trial. Um, and, and companies approach these claims in exactly the same way. So, you know, even, even if the company, uh, you know, even if the company thinks that you are asking for too much in damages, so they think you're, you're overinflating, you know, what, what you said the harm was to you, um, in, in many cases, they will actually, um, you know, perceive some leverage on, on your side just because they they don't want to go through an individual legal process with you. And they might come to the table and, and try to, you know, find a happy middle ground between what you say your damages are and what, uh, what they think they are. Um, I think companies do a pretty good job on the whole of, trying to maintain integrity in the dispute resolution system by pushing back on truly frivolous claims. And we actually try to filter all of those out to begin with. We try to not let them through our, our doors, our front doors to begin with. But, um, you know, I, I understand companies kind of going to the mat with, with a claim that they think is just totally, totally frivolous or false. Uh, but in, in most other instances, there's a huge amount of leverage that comes just from knowing the system is there and accessing it. And um, and the companies do come to the table, and m- most of these things sort of settle out fairly early in the process. Well, b- before we get to the, uh, I guess what will be our final uh, issue, which is again this idea of forced arbitration, um, I want to ask about an industry that you haven't mentioned yet. And I don't know if if there's a reason for that, or if it's maybe something that you're looking at down the line as 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 you move ahead with this with this venture, but. Another industry that so many consumers interact with and are frustrated by, and I know this from my own experience uh, in, in, in the cases that I've handled over the years, is the, ins- is the health insurance industry. And again, a really tangled l- labyrinthine process for resolving disputes against giant companies who it seems are almost built to deny your claim almost as a matter of course initially uh, and and, and only if you know how to press and when and and what doors to to barge your way through. Uh, Do do you have 
do you have any ch- chance of this? I mean, I, and and we accept this. I I I will. T- I mean, another personal story of this. I was uh, my 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 dad. I was in Cal- in California. My dad was in the hospital. There was a particular medication that his doctor wanted him to have in week one of his treatment. And when the resident came around and I asked about this medication, uh, and he said, well, you know, the, the, the insurance companies never approve it uh, in the first week. But by the second week, when we, re- when we re-request it, usually by then they come around and say yes. And I said, that's not good enough. Let me talk to the person in the hospital who deals with the insurance company. I want to know who at the insurance company they talk to. And I, I, you know, I didn't have to scream and yell. I just knew how to ask certain pointed questions. And literally the next day they had the drug. But all the people who didn't press lived with the insurance company's decision. And, and when you aggregate that from the company's perspective, they're saving a lot of money because they're not paying for that yep. drug in the first week. But the, the doctor actually wants the patient to have it. So it, was, it just seemed crazy to me. And, uh, and it's yep. just one example of, I think, what so many people deal with, whether it's, whether it's a prescription drug or a procedure. Um, I mean, I just scheduled a screening procedure. We had to move it back a month because it wasn't the full amount of time for when, you know, but we deal with these things all the time. Is that... Is that part of the, the, the business plan, or is that something you think could, could come along down the road for you? Because it, it has to be something so many people are, are, are dealing with. Yeah, I mean, so, so down the road, it, 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 it's definitely in the roadmap. Down the road, you know, really what we're aiming to be is a, an organization that sits on the consumer side of these, these large transactions that we have with these major consolidated industries. So insurance and kind of personal financial services is definitely one of them. And what you find in relationships like that, where you have an individual consumer who's buying a product or service from an extremely powerful consolidated seller, like an insurance company or a hospital system or a bank or a telco, um, is that the person on the other side of that transaction, the, the big company, is really good at using the system and harnessing the, you know, the system's complexity. And when I say system, I mean you know, the legal system, the financial system, the sort of set of rules, the operating system that our, our life runs on these days, that your counterparty is really, really good at using that. And, um, and usually the individual is not so good at, at navigating those complexities of those systems. And you know, today, with the state of technology, with the state of automation, with what you can do with machine learning and natural language processing and just basic software development, which has gotten really, really efficient, um, you can build a lot of tools and a lot of processes and a lot of services that, that you know, level the playing field a little bit and that give those consumers a simplicity layer on these very complex systems that allows them to use it in a, in a, in a comparable way and compete. With, with their counterparty in these transactions. So insurance is a great example of one of those types of interactions where you have a policy where your insurance company says they're going to cover something, and they might, they might say no just because they know that you don't know how to navigate the system to you know, hold them to that obligation. Um, and, and that's you know, something that's, a, that's an interaction that's susceptible to kind of the tools that we're, that we're building. So, uh, so it's definitely the roadmap. We'll get there. We're mm. not there yet. Fantastic. Well, okay. So that brings us to forced arbitration, which I consider one of the seven deadly sins of our legal system because it is so <laughs> contrary to fundament to, to what I regard as fundamental principles of everybody having equal access to the law. Um, how does that factor into what you encounter on behalf of consumers? Because so we know that so many. Uh, c- contracts today um, contain forced arbitration clauses, um, and 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 I mean right on down the line, all of these industries that we've been talking about um, have found uh, great advantage in uh, people really, for the most part, unwittingly, unknowingly agreeing to 
very severe limitations on their rights to dispute and to what they might recover in a dispute and, and so on. How, what, how does that play into and factor into what you're doing? Yeah, it is, it, it is the water in which we swim. I mean, we, what we do day in and day out is, is navigate the arbitration system. And you're right, it, it's, it's this huge, you know, you, you called it a, one of the seven deadly sins, but it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly one of the largest trends as far as individual legal rights goes, you know, for, for the last decade. I think people, it's starting to kind of pop up on these sort of end of decade lists that people have published. Um, and, and almost nobody knows about it. Yeah. So, um, you know, surveys are run every couple of years, and it's somewhere between 60 and 90 percent of people think that they, if you ask them, they think that they're not bound by an arbitration agreement. And, and you know, just, just to define it for your listeners, you know, any, any time you click through a, a contract online, so anytime you buy a service online or you sign a piece of paper, um, and any transaction you have with your any of these industries that we're talking about, you're, you're agreeing to this clause that basically says you agree that any dispute you have with that organization will be resolved through a private dispute resolution process, not the public court system. Um, and that, that private dispute resolution process is called arbitration. It's informal. It has limited discovery, so you know compared to a normal court case, limit, limited appeal. Uh, appeals process relative to a normal court case, and it almost across the board says um, you can't do anything collectively. So if you have a dispute, you have to you have to go through this process individually. No more class action. Well, and and, and sometimes even things, worse. I mean, I'm I'm dealing with this with the, one of the vendors uh, I'm trying to have trying to make a contract with for my law firm, and they sent over a contract, and it not only had language along the lines of what you're saying, but it had also, and I think. This is true of a lot of contracts, and people don't realize these terms are in there. It had language that I would pay their legal fees in any dispute, and it had what, what are called liquidated damage clauses, meaning that in a case of a dispute, no matter what my damages are, I'm limited to a fixed amount. And, of course, it's a very low amount because the contract is written by the company. Um, these are all examples of limitations on our rights that would be unlimited if 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 we knew the 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 meaning of these terms and and the meaning of these clauses and and knew that actually in many cases you can push back on that yeah yeah well yeah you, you, that that's a really good point but <laughs> yes you can push back on it cuz you're you're an attorney and especially in a commercial transaction but you know, the vast majority of consumer or employment uh, contracts are adhesion contracts, and those are things that are sort of take it or leave it. They're you know drafted by the company, and they're just you, half the time you don't even see them. You kind of just acknowledge that you agree to them when you when you press a button or or when you sign a piece of paper. And um, and the surveys show that you know 60 to 90 percent of people don't even think that they have agreed to anything like that. So it's not even that. We know it's there, and we just don't understand what it says and the power of it, and all of the rights that we're waiving. It's that we don't even know it's there, and um, and and most most people, you know, that's why most people don't realize this arbitration system even exists or that it's a thing. And most people think that class actions are still sort of out there protecting them from labor um, or consumer, uh, you know, common common uh, issues with with big businesses. So what are you what are you finding then as your company is handling disputes, uh, consumer disputes, where I would imagine a lot of the agreements that underlie those disputes contain some form of um, forced arbitration or other rights limiting language are you finding that the companies will resolve those disputes even though that language is in the contract because it is clearly if challenged it would be found to be an unfair or adhesion type contract we we only what we do is we make the arbitration run system run smoothly so we only handle disputes that are subject to arbitration agreements um and and you know a lot of those 
clauses that you talked about with, you know, liquidated damages and limitations, fee shifting of attorney's fees. Um, those are those are more prevalent in commercial contracts than in consumer contracts, um, just because there's certain, you know, more stringent limitations about what's enforceable in, in a consumer adhesion contract. Uh, so we, we don't see we don't see a ton of those. Um, but everything everything we deal with is subject to an arbitration clause, and uh, and really what what we're designed to do is you know arbitration clauses were were built to kind of kill the class action system and to you know make everyone pursue these claims piecemeal through a, a relatively complex system, um, and when when companies when companies you know, put these clauses in their in their contracts. I think they they assumed that no one was going to use them because they're they're too complex and they're sort of hidden, you know, deep in contracts. And what we exist to do is to make that system work like it's supposed to, to make the arbitration uh, arbitration system be an efficient, a fair, a cost effective, and an accessible place to resolve these disputes, and make it actually a powerful venue for consumers to resolve disputes. And, and as you said, so, um, so we're all as, about that. And as you said before, to level, level the playing field somewhat, which most people probably think would never happen when they when they're just one person standing up against a giant telecom company or a giant bank. But 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 through this process, yeah. if you understand the process and have help navigating the process, then the then the playing field can be leveled pretty significantly. Yep. Yep, exactly. Fantastic. Well, listen, I, I, I have to say, I didn't think we'd have more than five minutes to talk about because I thought it was going to be so straightforward. But this is so fascinating and and so important. I, I, uh, I'm i going to take a look at fairshake.com. I think if uh, uh, people have questions about it, uh, they, I, I'm, they can contact a teal through the company through the website fairshake.com we'll put a link to uh that website in the description for this episode when it airs uh am i saying your name correctly teal lidow is that is that my saying it correctly teal lido lido teal thank you so much this is a, a a great issue for so many literally millions of people in the country um and i wish you the best of luck with fair shake fantastic Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for having me on.